Okay, so today we're going to talk about less than five one nodes congruent figures. Now, two objects are congruent if they have the same shape and size. The definition of congruent polygons. Now, polygons are closed figures with more than two sides. Some examples of polygons are triangles, squares, this figure, and this quadrilateral here. So as long as it is a closed figure with more than two sides, then you are considered a polygon. So definition of congruent polygons. Two polygons, including triangles, are congruent if number one, the corresponding angles are congruent, and number two, the corresponding sides are congruent. And when we describe congruent polygons, we need to list the vertices in order of correspondence. Now the word vertices is plural for the word vertex. So this is a vertex, this is a vertex, this is a vertex, and if I have all three vertices here, well, vertices is just plural for the word vertex. So the congruent parts of triangles, what we're looking at right here are triangles. They are always marked alike. And we're going to go ahead and determine the corresponding angles and the corresponding sides. And if these two conditions are met, then we write a congruent statement. So I'm going to go ahead and start with corresponding angles. And I've already highlighted the angles for you, right? So I'm going to go ahead and start looking at this triangle and compare that to this triangle here. I notice that angle A has two arcs has one, two arcs for angle A. If I look at this other triangle, I need to find the angle that has the same number of arcs as angle A, which in this case is angle H. So angle A and angle H, based on the number of arcs they have, I can say that they are congruent. And I can say the same thing for angle B and J. And lastly, angle C and angle K. Now, the next thing that I want to do is look at the corresponding sides. When I look at the corresponding sides, I look at the number of tick marks. For instance, line segment AB has one tick mark and line segment HJ has one tick mark as well. So we can say that these two segments correspond to each other and they are congruent. So I write segment AB is congruent to line segment HJ. The next thing I wanna look at is line segment BC. Line segment BC has two tick marks and I can compare that to line segment JK, which has two tick marks as well. So we can say that line segment BC is congruent to line segment JK. And then lastly, line segment AC is congruent to line segment HK because they have three tick marks. So we've been looking at this triangle here first before we look at that triangle. This triangle, we're going to call this triangle A, B, C. So triangle A, B, C is congruent to triangle whatever this is. And when we write our congruent statement, we need to make sure they are listed in order of correspondence. So I'm looking at angle A it corresponds with angle H, so that's going to be the first letter of the right-hand side of the congruence symbol. So A corresponds with H, B corresponds with J, and C corresponds with K. So we have triangle A, B, C is congruent to triangle H, J, K. 
So allow me to clarify on how you should write a congruent statement. As you can see, I wrote triangle ABC. So I started with A, then B, to C, and then back to A, right? So this would be triangle ABC. When you're writing this part, the left-hand side of the congruent symbol, it doesn't matter, right? You can actually call this, if you wanted to, triangle CAB or triangle CBA. See that I'm going around and then coming back to the letter that I started with, right? So C, A, B, and then back to C, right? So that's triangle CAB or triangle CBA. Triangle A, B, C, or triangle A, C, B. So as long as you're going around and coming back to the letter that you started with, this side, it doesn't matter what you put here. However, on the right hand side of the congruence symbol, you need to list in order of correspondence, right? We said that A is the first letter, therefore H is also the first letter. And we look at B, which is the second letter. J is the second letter. C is the third letter. So K is the third letter. So that's how we write a congruent statement. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to this part of the notes. It says show that the polygons are congruent by identifying all the congruent corresponding parts then write a congruent statement. So what I already have listed out are the corresponding angles and the corresponding sides, right? The corresponding angles we look at, you know, based on the number of arcs. And for the corresponding sides, we look at based on the number of tick marks. So I said angle P is congruent to angle G, angle Q is congruent to angle F, angle R is congruent to angle E, and angle S is congruent to angle D, right? So we have the corresponding angles. So for the corresponding sides, we have line segment PQ, which corresponds to line segment GF. So they are congruent to each other. Line segment QR is congruent to line segment FE. Line segment RS is congruent to line segment ED and line segment SP is congruent to line segment DG. So we have the corresponding angles and the corresponding sides. I'm going to choose this quadrilateral and a quadrilateral just means that you have four sides of a figure. Um, I'm just going to call this quadrilateral P Q R S. So quadrilateral PQRS is congruent to quadrilateral. So P is first, G is also first, so I have to write G here. And then we have QRS, QRS, so it's quadrilateral GFED. And that's how you write your congruent statement. CPCTC, which stands for corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So if two triangles or polygons are congruent, then all corresponding parts are congruent. CPCTC, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Let me go ahead and give you an example. You're given this congruent statement. Triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DFE. And we practice writing congruent statements. In general, when we write congruent statements, they must be in order of correspondence. Since this is given, it implies the statement is already written in order of correspondence. So we can use that to our advantage to solve problems. Since these two triangles are congruent, then we can say that angle A 
is congruent to angle D because those are the first letters, right? So angle A is congruent to angle D by CPCTC. So by CPCTC. We can say the same thing about angle B and angle F. Why are they congruent? Because these two triangles are congruent, then by CPCTC, angle B is congruent to angle F. And we can say the same thing about angle C, which is congruent to angle E. So once again, since these two triangles are congruent, by the corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, then angle C is congruent to angle E. But we don't just stop at angles. CPCTC is not limited to just angles. We can also talk about the side lengths, right? Because triangles do have side lengths. So if I look, oh, here are the first two letters. That's line segment AB. And since those are the you know two letters, the first two letters, then we can look at this triangle here and we look at the first two letters of that particular triangle, which is line segment DF. And why are these two line segments congruent? Well, because of CPCTC. So line segment AB is congruent to line segment DF. We can say the same thing about line segment BC and line segment FE. So line segment BC is congruent to line segment FE by CPCTC. And we cannot forget about the first and the last letter. So line segment AC has to be congruent to line segment DE. So line segment AB is congruent to line segment DE by CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So our goal here is to find the values of X and Y. And we have these two triangles here, so let's take a look at them. We have triangle ABC, so ABC, and it is congruent to triangle DFE. So we need to, again, we need to find the values of X and Y. So where's X? This is where X is. It's part of FE. And we have Y, which is part of angle F. So we can see that the measure of FE is 2Y plus X, right? And we know that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DFE. If I look at FE, that corresponds with BC. So FE corresponds with BC. So I can write... FE equals BC, and then I'm going to apply substitution. 2Y plus X equals 38.4. And I'm looking at this equation. I can't solve for X, nor can I solve for Y, because we have more than one variable. So that means I have to come back to it. I need to find one of the variables, plug in, and then solve for the variable that I want, right? So I need to, you know, come back to this later. Let's look at this angle here. So it has Y, and 8Y minus 5 degrees is part of angle F. It's pointing at angle F. So if I'm looking for what it corresponds with, angle F is congruent to angle B. So angle F is congruent to angle B. So I write measure of angle F equals the measure of angle B. The measure of angle F is 8Y minus 5, which is equal to 99. And then I can go ahead and apply algebra. So 8Y is equal to 104. So Y equals 13. So I found Y, then I can go ahead and plug it in here. So 2 times 13 
plus x equals 38.4 and that's going to give me 26 plus x equals 38.4 so x is equal to 12.4 and that's my answer okay so number three says in the diagram triangle rsv is congruent to triangle tvs find the value of x and y so we have x degrees which is angle t so the measure of angle t is x degrees and this 2y minus 1 which carries that y and that's part of let me use a different highlighter here that's part of rs so we have rs which corresponds with TV. So where's TV? It's right there. So RS is equal to TV. 2Y minus 1 equals 24. So 2Y equals 25. And Y equals 12.5. So we found the value of Y. For X, we have angle T. And angle T corresponds with angle R. So the measure of angle T equals the measure of angle R. And the measure of angle T is currently X. And the measure of angle R, if we look closely, is blank. However, look at this. We have 78 degrees. We have 90 degrees. So then what's left over? Well, we need to do 180 minus 90 minus 78 and that's going to give us 12. so the measure of angle r is just 12 and that's our x value and there you have it so the third angles theorem states that if two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of a second triangle then it implies that the third angles of the triangles are congruent so let's take a look at these two triangles here. We can see that if angle C is congruent to angle K and angle B is congruent to angle J, then what does that imply? It implies that angle A must be congruent to angle L. And that's me using the third angles theorem, right? So if we said that this is 40 degrees and this is 40 degrees and this is 60 degrees and that's 60 degrees, then what does that imply? It implies that these angles must be congruent. So it means this is 80 and this is 80. And that's the third angles theorem. Okay, so let's go ahead and find the value of x here. We can see that these two angles are congruent and these two angles are congruent. So what does that mean? It implies that these angles, angle M, must be congruent to angle T. That's me using the third angles theorem, right? So what can we do here? Well, we know that the measure of angle M is equal to the measure of angle T. And the measure of angle T is currently 2x plus 30. But I don't know what the measure of angle M is. However, we do know what the measure of angle N and the measure of angle L are. And this is a triangle. So I can do 180 minus 55 minus 65 and that's going to give me 60 degrees so the measure of angle m is 60 degrees so then i'm going to go ahead and, and find the value of x so x is 15.